My name's Vera and today I've got Trish, who's one of our education staff, and Dr. Rolf Schmidt, our museum expert. So for those who haven't seen the Tyrannosaur exhibition yet, the Tyrannosaur exhibition is obviously about the Tyrannosaur family, their evolution, their paleontology, what we know about them, and of course some questions about what we'd like to find out about them. Before we hand over to Trish and to Dr. Rolf, I'd like to welcome the following schools who are watching with us today. So we've got community kids from Melton, Warrnambool College, North Fitzroy Primary School, Gormandale and District Primary School, welcome, Ararat. We've got Ely, Tuberak, I hope I pronounced that right, Paranbin, Altona Green, Silverton Primary School in Noble Park and Mal Melton Secondary College. So welcome everybody. Now, here's Trish, who's uh, going to ask Rolf our first question. Thanks, Vera. Okay, I thought it would be useful to start by um, identifying what separates tyrannosaurs from other dinosaurs. So, tyrannosaurs belong to, sorry about my voice, it's a little bit rusty today. Um, so, tyrannosaurs belong to a bigger group of predatory dinosaurs called the theropods. And a lot of their bodies are fairly similar but the thing that's really characteristic about a lot of them is their skulls. So we're standing in front of a whole range of species of tyrannosaurs here. And as you can see, um, some of them you'll almost immediately recognize as, as a tyrannosauroid kind of animal. Um, some of the things that set them apart are apparently their teeth have a, if you cut them in half, they, they have sort of a D shape cross-section which gives them a nice blade on the edge probably made them very successful but um the interesting thing about the skulls is as you might remember from the jurassic park movie they talk about how this was one of the questions i think um do tyrannosaurs have good eyesight and can they only see movement well no that is completely inaccurate because if you look at these skulls you can see some of these they've got very big holes in their skull making their skulls very light but one of the holes is the area where the eye socket sits. And if you look down the front of the snout, it's very narrow, very sculpted, which allowed them to see very, very clearly in three dimensions out the front of them. And it's estimated that their eyesight was actually better than a lot of modern predatory birds, for example. So they could see incredibly well. And that helped them, especially when they had to um, hunt um, ferocious um, prey like triceratops or um with the big armored ankylosaurs you don't want to you don't want to miss those in the bushes if um if you're hunting them because if you miss one of those horns you're not going to live for very long so that the, the tyrannosaurs um we can actually look inside their skull today and see what the brain looked like and so the brain if you look at the area where we think the eyesight is processed it showed that they were capable of processing um, eyesight really well so they could hunt exceptionally well they were probably ferocious and this is why they were so successful they um, dominated a lot of the um, the predator um, ecology um, in the in the later part of the age of dinosaurs so um, we've had a couple of questions here as well um, that were sent in um, prior to our session today um, and so Dr. Rolf while we we're going around the exhibition looking at the highlights one of the questions was are all dinosaurs big and scary or are some nice and don't attack people if they was if they, they wouldn't attack people if they were still alive so should we head around to another part of the exhibition to show everybody yeah so that's a good question um, we think of dinosaurs mostly as these gigantic monsters um, including, of course, the ferocious tyrannosaurs. But um, the, the dinosaurs came in every shape and size, really. So you have things that are as small as a kitten, um, up to, of course, the really gigantic long neck sauropods, which weighed tens of tons. And um, a lot of them were probably similar to going out in Africa, if, you, if you're among the elephants and the hippopotamus. Um, they're big but as long as you're harmless. However, of course, we're in the Tyrannosaur exhibition, so the most famous of the Tyrannosaurs is, of course, T-Rex. And this is what we're seeing behind me. And I'll just go up close to it so you get an idea of the actual size of this thing. 
So the T-Rex was probably one of the, if not the biggest Tyrannosaur um, species. There are other predatory dinosaurs that were bigger, but amongst the Tyrannosaurs, T-Rex was sort of, as the name says, the king. And compared to me, this thing is huge. Really makes you makes you realize how big they were. Um, of course, if you look at the arms, they look absolutely puny, but if I stand next to it, you can tell their arms are actually as big as mine, and apparently they were up to four times as strong as the strongest human's arms today. So they weren't necessarily completely helpless with those arms. And um, they, although they didn't really need those arms, they had these massive legs with claws, and, um, and of course the huge jaws that they could just tear apart the animals. Um, but they needed to be this big because the, the herbivores at the time, the plant eaters they were hunting were huge as well. Um, they were sort of contemporary with things like um, triceratops, like I mentioned. So they were big, so you needed to be big as well. Okay. Um, we have a question from Tumarak and uh, they want to know whether you know of any dinosaurs that were venomous. Oh wow, that's that's a tricky question. Um, with with fossils, we have we can't actually see something like that. Like the venom would be long gone. Um, however, as with modern day venomous animals like snakes, you can tell amongst the structures uh, <laughs> amongst the structures in their in their teeth and and body. You can see if there were any ducts that fed venom into the teeth or something like that. I'm not aware that any of them were, but I don't see any reason why there couldn't have been. So it might be um, that there are, we are looking, haven't found it yet, but that doesn't mean it might not happen in the future. It's certainly an adva advantageous adapt, uh, adaptation uh, for hunting animals, certainly. So we have another question here um, from Altona. How big were Tyrannosaurs? And um, then they asked, uh, and then somebody also asked, why are the bones yellow? That's a pretty good question. Um, so for the first one, <laughs> this big, <laughs> um, they were they were the Tyrannosaurs. Um, we've got in this exhibition, we've got um, one fossil of a, a probably the smallest Tyrannosauroid, um, which is smaller than me. Sort of about the size of a large dog, less than less than sort of one and a half meters long, um, up to more than ten meters in length, like the Tyrannosaur. Um, they, in terms of height, it's difficult. It's because of the way that we now reconstruct them. They they sort of probably stood quite horizontal, head out the forward, and the tail balancing out the back. Not like the old reconstructions where they stood upright, tail dragging. So in terms of height, they might not have been overly tall, but they were certainly in length, they were quite impressive. Um, so there's, there's a whole range of sizes amongst them. In terms of the bones, um, the color that you're looking at is how they were preserved in the fossil record. So when, as paleontologists, we actually usually don't care too much about the color because the color doesn't necessarily tell us anything about the animal itself. It tells us how they were preserved and a lot of dinosaur bones, um, they, the bones started off with the same composition as our bones, um, which is a, a chemical or a mineral called calcium phosphate, um, which is very strong and, and, can, and animals can um, make their bones out of them quite efficiently. Um, but as after, over the millions of years of being underground and groundwater flowing through with chemicals in it, um, often the bones, the, the, the mineral gets replaced sort of almost molecule by molecule by other chemicals. And one of the most common ones is it gets replaced by a silica, which is sort of a, a form of quartz. Um, it's like glass, glass is made out of silica. And, um, and so it gets what we call silicified. And often it does it in such a good way that you can actually tell down to the tiniest feature um, what the what the bone you looked like in life, even though it's completely replaced by a new mineral, and that can, I think he just did a pop off, um, and uh, and so uh, even though the even though the um, uh, yeah, so the, the bones can look of a variety of colors, but often um, 
because of where they were preserved, you get this sort of yellowy browny color, um, especially here in Australia. Well, in Australia, actually, a lot of the bones we find are black um, because they're, they're preserved in a different kind of environment than, for example, the famous ones in, in uh, North America, where a lot of the most famous dinosaurs sort of came from, like Triceratops and T-Rex. Um, so the ones we find here in Victoria are actually black. Um, so that's a similar, um, a similar mineral replaced them, but the way it was done was different. So it had a different color. Ah, oh, so, um, yes, these, the, the fossils we have on display here reconstructed in life, in kind of replicas, um, the, it's, I'd, I'm not aware of a single dinosaur fossil that's actually every single bone has been found in the original, but there are um, a few tyrannosaurs, I think one called Sue, which was found some, a few decades ago, um, which is 80% complete, and that's probably one of the most complete ones. Um, so there's only a few bones missing, and um, it would also be incredibly heavy to reconstruct um, something replaced by rock basically i think we would have many more support structures in here but they are all based on the original thing we do have a few original actual bones so there's um an original bone of, of, of a shin bone so the the bone you have on, on the bottom of your leg um that's the original t-rex one so this is the real thing there's also a um a claw from one of its fingers and a tooth um, and they're all, they are the real thing. Um, but um, you can see this one's actually crushed. So by the preservation, it was before it got toughened into like a, a rock, um, they probably the weight of the sediment lying on top of it crushed it. Because if you think bones are quite spongy and hollow. So uh, it's preserved in a, in a imperfect way. So when we reconstruct them, we sort of take away that imperfection and make it look nice. <laughs> Okay, we have a few questions about how old these bones are. You sort of started to hint about that um, and how they actually dig up the fossils. Okay. Shall we move to a different... There's a, there's a nice picture over here of one of the sort of a more classic <laughs> paleontologist in the field. Um, so there's been... When we, when we find them, it, it varies how they're preserved, how we have to get at them. So um, the classic sort of uh, movie version of just brushing away the sand, uh, that almost never happens, sadly. Usually you find the, the bones embedded solidly in, in massive rock. So for example, the ones we, we look, at, look for here in Victoria, um, there's actually an original one of, one of uh, the only Tyrannosaur fossil ever found in Australia, um, this is the actual bone here, um, when they had to get that out, it was embedded in solid sandstone. So sandstone is made of sand that um, uh, down here, it was these big river plains and probably every now and then it flooded and, and swept animals along with them and killed them. So bad for them, good for us. We find these these bones in there, but it takes months sometimes to to take away very painstakingly the the grains that are literally glued to the rock and um and uh, and it sounds like uh, it sounds like you're working next door to a dentist because they use these little drills <laughs> um and um and the problem is in our case actually the bones the way they're preserved they're actually softer than the rock they're in so you can imagine the extra um the extra delicacy of that but um you end up getting some incredible preservations um, out of that still if you're if you're really patient um, and these people are I personally am not but <laughs> I don't have to do it so we've got some questions here about um, did they live in groups or by themselves um, and also a question about where would they if could they come back to life and where would they live on earth if if they were alive today Wow, that's a, that's a bunch of very tough questions. So what was the first one? Uh, Remind me. Do they live in groups? Oh, do they live in groups? This has been, yeah, the, this, our thinking has changed quite a bit about this. Um, it was even a time when 
Um, re fairly recently, it was thought that T-Rex was too big to actively hunt and it was just a scavenger that came in sort of individually after somebody else killed an animal for it. That sort of changed again and it does look like a lot of these theropod, these predatory dinosaurs like the tyrannosaurs or velociraptors did live in groups sort of similar, <clears throat> sorry, similar to a pride of lions or something like that where um, where they do cooperate to hunt. Um, but even if you think about um, sort of modern day predators, similar looking ones like uh, lions and tigers and bears, oh my, they, they, some, some of them hunt in packs, some of them don't. So you have to almost have to look at each individual species um, and it's very difficult to tell what their activity was, obviously, because you only find a few bones lying there. Sometimes you find a mass grave, but it still doesn't always tell you how they lived. So we've it's taken literally like century or more to sort of start teasing out the life habits, but it seems to indicate, I think, that they did hunt in pairs. As for where they would live today, that's a, that's a really interesting question because like I was saying, this bone that we found here in Victoria, which is about 100 million years old, at that time, Australia, Victoria especially, was a lot further south. Um, so if you, you might know that continents drift today very slowly. So Australia is going north at about the rate that your fingernails grow every year, every day. It moves a little bit. And um, at the time that these dinosaurs lived down here, Australia was so far south, it was within the Antarctic Circle, which means in winter, you had several months of complete darkness. Um, and, and in summer, you had several months of complete uh, permanent daylight. Um, so it did mean that it was probably pretty cold. Um, so dinosaurs weren't necessarily restricted to just the lush tropics as they're often pictured. They pr could probably survive in quite cold environments where it snowed in winter. Um, so the Cretaceous during which these lived was a fairly warm period. So there wasn't this severe ice uh, on the poles as we have today, but um, they certainly could live all across the globe. And um, so they could live anywhere if we could bring them today. But the Jurassic Park scenario is highly unlikely because DNA that they use to reconstruct them just does not last that long. Even a million years is tough. All right. So just while we're walking over to the next part of the exhibition, there've been some questions about how do we assemble dinosaurs how do we know what they look like and as you were telling us before it's a bit like a puzzle piece you get a few bones you get a few a few bits of evidence how do we really know um how they looked and you know now we're here at the feathered dinosaurs that's it's a good way to segue in um yeah so that's that's a really good question and often we do get it wrong and in history in, in the history of paleontology there have been sort of a few almost um, laughable <laughs> mistakes. But in general, because dinosaurs belong to the vertebrates, which is what we belong to, anything with uh, bones on the inside and a backbone, um, the amount of bones and the type of bones in every single vertebrate, be it mammal, um, dinosaur, reptile, even down to fish, is, is pretty similar. So we have an idea of um, there can be variation in shape and size um, amongst the bones, but if you're a good, um, a good scientist, good anatomist, basically, um, you can recognize if it's, a, if it's a, a little bone on a toe or if it's a skull bone, obviously. Um, and so from that, you can get a good idea of where the bone should have gone. And like I was showing earlier, that single bone that's been found um, the, the scientists know pretty well where in the body that went and because of that they could see from the shape that it probably belonged to a tyrannosaur and not to a different predatory dinosaur or even some other dinosaur at all. So it, it, it's constantly sort of evolving uh, that knowledge of how to reconstruct them. So they used to be reconstructed often quite wrong. So for example the long-necked dinosaurs they were constructed with their heads all the way up but it looks like the bones in their neck didn't allow that, so they probably had their necks quite vertical. Um, same with the T-Rex was constructed upright, but it was probably fairly straight, flat. Um, yeah, so so this is really awesome, this reconstruction. Um, 
if you've obviously seen Jurassic Park and Jurassic World and you've been on the internet at all, you've probably heard the complaints from scientists that they didn't make the velociraptors feathered in the new movie. Um, so how do you know that, there's, that they were feathered? Um, in the last sort of 15 years, roughly, um, there have been huge amounts of um, fossils found, especially in places like China, that actually preserve um, soft tissues, like feathers and skin even. Um, and normally you can imagine that stuff gets eaten away straight away by other animals or bacteria even. So you need very exceptional um, preservation to preserve that. And from that, we can now tell gradually that pretty much all of these theropod dinosaurs, the group that um, the tyrannosaurs, but also the velociraptors belong to. So the little one at the end is actually tyrannosaur. This one is a velociraptor, you can tell from the giant hind claw. Um, and they had all had some kind of feather. And we also know from anatomy and the feathers that chickens and all other birds are actually just sort of stunted dinosaurs. Um, <laughs> so um, so the, the, the feathers um, actually are much more common than used to be thought. And it looks like maybe even the very earliest dinosaurs had some form of primitive feather and some of the other dinosaurs like the Triceratops and that, they sort of actually lost the feathers rather than it evolving later. There's still some controversy about that, but um, they were certainly, um, it seems to be much more common than used to be thought. And it was probably evolved for, to insulate, to keep them warm maybe. Um, and later sort of that, that feature was adapted into being used for flight gradually. So you have, you can actually see almost step by step the progression from feathered dinosaur to flying bird. And we find feathers down here in Victoria, um, well-preserved feathers that people are now being able to identify just from the single feather, did it belong to a bird? Did it belong to a dinosaur? Uh, like a, a non-bird dinosaur or even a little chick or an adult. Um, so, so the signs of feathered dinosaurs have come very far in just a recent time. So why is it a chicken? Is it well, the, the, chicken, the chicken is just uh, the modern version of a, of a T-Rex really. So if we, want to, if we wanted to get dinosaurs back, there is actually an idea rather than getting DNA out of amber, which is just not going to last, like I said, um, people are thinking you can actually reverse engineer the DNA of a chicken or a bird and try and turn it back into a dinosaur. And there are, there have been, I think there's even been sort of by natural mutation, a toothed, they found a toothed bird somewhere. Um, so sometimes the genetic mutation actually sort of almost sets time backwards, even though there's no such thing as devolution, but you can sometimes bring back some primitive states by just tweaking the genes. Um, but that's a whole different topic. So now, guys, um, unfortunately, we're, we're almost over. And there's so many amazing questions here from everybody. There are a lot of questions about extinction. So, uh, you know, how long did, were the dinosaurs around? Um, and, um, and what happened to them? What happened to all these amazing, terrible lizards? Uh, that's, that's a, I love that question because that's, that's a talk I just gave, which is where I lost my voice. <laughs> I was so passionate about it. Um, so the, the interesting thing about the dinosaurs is obviously they really dominated land life for over a hundred million years. So they, they, some of the earliest dinosaurs evolved about 200 million years, give or take, and they died out, all the ones except for ones that turned into birds, um, they died out 66 million years ago. And that they died out was has always been quite clear, but we were, we've never been completely certain about what happened. And in, in popular sort of uh, uh, reporting, you, you now understand probably that um, there was a big asteroid that hit the Earth right around that time. And the reason we know that is, um, and here's a, here's a drill core that they did. So they drilled into the Earth, into the rock, and this is the rock they get up out of the drill core. And so you have um, at the bottom of the drill core is where you still get dinosaurs, not necessarily in this drill core, but of that age, you get dinosaurs. And then suddenly there's a layer, usually sort of a clay layer that contains 
a huge amount of the element iridium, which is very rare on Earth, but very common in asteroids. And so there's this spike of iridium. And the only way you can explain that happening across the world at the same time is that a big asteroid hit the Earth. And the asteroid was probably about 10 kilometers across, probably the biggest asteroid to hit the Earth in the last half a billion years. And so that was a bad day <laughs> on Earth. Um, and it doesn't completely explain why they all died out and why some didn't. Um, there were other things going on at the time that probably stressed life. There were huge volcanic eruptions in India called the Deccan Traps, and they covered they covered about a third of that continent, thousands of square kilometers in over a kilometer of lava. So that can't be too good either. So there was sort of a perfect storm of things that that's probably killed off the dinosaurs. But as we know, the dinosaurs didn't all die out. The, the birds are still around, and in a way, they're all, the dinosaurs are almost more successful than they ever have been because of that. And they can fly, which we can't. Thank you, Dr. Rolf. Now, guys, you guys have sent through some really amazing questions today. And that's what scientists do. They ask questions all the time. There's always more to learn. And as you can see, we only know so much about dinosaurs. There's still so much for us to find out. So please keep asking questions. And uh, one of the last questions here is, how did you get this job? Now, I know that Dr. Rolf has been at the museum since 2002. So that's quite a long time ago. You'll have to use your maths to work out how long. But he studied geology and um and has a fascination with uh fossils and different kinds of of things that tell us about our past but also give us information about our future so like i said please keep asking questions thank you so much for all of these questions i reckon we've got about two weeks worth of questions here um thank you dr of thank you trish um thank you guys very much have a good friday and thank you for the really cool questions it shows that you're thinking like scientists keep it up we need more of that <laughs>